know? Week. And we've all had a good week. <coughs> now, what did I forget last week? <laughs> and I said, I'll bring them in for the children. But there's only one. Oh. Oh. So someone's going to have a very upset belly later, aren't they? <laughs> so if I give you these, and if any more children come in, you can share them with them, yeah? So, all them there. Oh, <laughs> Well, thank you for all coming today to deliver the word that Lord's put on his heart to give to us. And welcome to Guest We Have today. And hope you enjoy the service and you will return. Well, we'll hand over to Peter now who will give the notices. It's good to see you all this morning. And I'll also say thank you to <coughs> Phil for coming. He tell me, tells me this. Uh, a quick conversation and tells me he's been working in, or he's working in China at the moment. I'm sure it's the last time it was America. And I think the time before that might be Australia. Yeah. So our uh, globe trotting uh, no try. But thank you for coming. And, uh, and, uh, please give our love to your church at Wickford. Yes, still this morning there will be communion in the service and 6 p.m. we have service tonight and that will be led by myself. On Monday we have the Monday social here at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday 7 p.m. prayer and Bible study. <coughs> Thursday 10 a.m. coffee hour which is no events for the children as they are on school holiday and then next Sunday 14th of April in the morning, 10.30 be myself. There will be jam for the children. Got the nod there. And in the evening, 6 pm it'll be calm. Streets for prayer this week. Orchard clothes, pointers lane, and rebels lane. The other youths or, or our sister church remembering prayer this week is the one at Camberwell. In South London and missionary focus good news for everyone who were formerly known as Gideon's UK. <coughs> and that's all the notices we'll just give thanks for the offerings. <coughs> Heavenly Father you are a good God. It's something we say every week because it is so true. And Heavenly Father as Perhaps in appreciation, monetary gifts have been given and put in the offering box at the back there. Again, in, in thanks. May you bless the, bless the gifts we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we practice that English greeting. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Depending on which country I am, depends what people do. All sorts of things. <laughs> That's just the Because the Americans high five you, which is a weird. Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, I'm just going to start by actually reading a few verses from Psalm 145. This is the week after Easter. You don't seem very excited by that. <laughs> <laughs> it hadn't been for Easter, we wouldn't have this week as Christians. Is that fair to say? Yes. Have you heard that famous Christian joke about the... About the I'll tell you a Christian joke. Shall I start with a Christian joke? Yeah. Pilate said to uh, Joseph Arimathea, why did you give away that really expensive tomb? You took ages to have it built and made. It cost a lot of money. You gave it away to a rabble, rebel leader who allegedly is a king of the Jews, but it's probably just a troublemaker. Joseph Aram and Theo replies, I just lent it to him for a weekend. Are <laughs> <laughs> you impressed by that? We can finish now. I think we're done. Okay. Psalm 145. And I'm just going to read uh, a few verses from this, so just bear with me as I just jump a couple of verses. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of your glorious splendor, of your majesty, and I'll meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works, 
but I will proclaim your deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Down to verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and forever. We're called this week, this morning, to give praise, to meditate, to give praise, to tell of what God has done. Let's stand and sing our opening song together, 744. If you are not up on the overhead, uh, Christ is risen, honey. <laughs> Because you have indeed, are, you are indeed our saviour. You have risen from the dead. In thy name I ask it. Amen. We're going to sing again, which is uh, which will come up on the overhead here. 
which is the song uh, He Was Pierced. You still with the team as me of death and resurrection. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my cup, which is poured out for you. And now we turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. And reading from verse 23 to 31. <coughs> For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you ever eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body of love of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. 
That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we will not come to come not come under such judgment. This is the work of the Lord. As you probably guessed, we're going to talk a little bit about communion later on today. In fact, we're going to do communion as well, so we can learn a little bit about it and also partake in it as a body uh, together. And it's important to celebrate these things uh, and to mark these occasions. Uh, some of you, uh, I've known most of you probably for 20 odd years. Uh, next Sunday, which is the 14th of April, I know that, I, I should know that, uh, because it's also my 40th wedding anniversary. Uh, which I was reminded of a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> 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 I, had, I thought it was about 38 years. It turns out it's 40 years. So that's quite exciting. It was me and my wife, were, uh, you've met Tracy a few times, which brings animals here, uh, you'll know that uh, we were engaged actually for four years. So technically, we've been married by a biblical standards for 44 years. Uh, but she doesn't really recognise that anymore. So 40 years it is. <laughs> so, uh, these are these, there to celebrate that and to celebrate communion uh, together this morning. I'm going to pray now. Uh, we're going to pray uh, just for uh, what uh, calls the church intercessory prayer, just to bring a number of things. As I pray, I'm sure there are things on your mind, perhaps family things or things to do in your personal life or in society that you would also like to pray. Do, do that uh, as I pray uh, in your own mind, uh, as I just try and bring our thoughts together uh, to ask God to intervene in a number of situations that I'm sure we're all aware of in the world in which we live. Let's pray uh, together. Heavenly Father, despite the fact that today we celebrate and are celebrating you and what you've done for us and we'll go on to do that even more if you think about communion, we can also avoid being in a bubble here. The world in which we live is a very difficult place. And so Lord, first of all we pray for the situations of war around our world. We pray for what is almost becoming the forgotten war between Ukraine and Russia. Our job, Lord, is not around politics. Our job is to see peace and the righteousness of God in that place. We pray for the Christians that are existing on both sides of that wall and are trying perhaps to spend their lives looking after others or spreading your word. Bring peace and ownership and leadership to the people involved in that war. We pray for what we read about Israel, which is your nation, and the Palestines. Again, politics prevents us, Lord, taking necessarily a view but Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for peace. We pray for safety for civilians, Lord. And at the end of it, we pray that your will is done. And as Christians operate, perhaps on both sides of that conflict, again you may reach out, protect them and help them as they seek to serve you. We pray for our own nation, Lord. Polarised in many opinions, polarised in many politics, with very poor leadership in our nation. We pray that you may send us the leaders that are Christians, that are God-given, that can bring a real change to our country. We pray for our royal family. We pray for their faith. We pray for their health. That they again may know the touch of God. We don't pray this in vain. We pray because we fundamentally believe you will answer our prayer. And then we pray for Essex. Accounting often the butt of other jokes, of other people's opinions. But Lord, you've called us here. You've called the church here in Great Wakering to Great Wakering. Use us to spread your word. Use us to set up as your example that we may see people saved, lives changed, and communities turned around. And whatever else is in our minds right now, I pray that Lord, you'll reach out and touch that situation, that person, that issue, that your will may be done, our prayers may be answered, and we may see you glorified. I ask these things in thy name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to turn back to one of those really for a while, which is 1 Corinthians uh, <coughs> and chapter 11. It is very easy sometimes in our Christianity just to rush across subjects that we're very familiar with. And one of those which I wanted to uh, have a little chat through with, with us this morning is around the concept of communion. Uh, particularly because it's Easter time and particularly because it happens to be uh, the Sunday where uh, you do communion here, it seemed appropriate for me uh, to do so. 
And of course, in my head, I sort of smile a little bit because, you know, if we speak as much as I do, both secular uh, and as a Christian, you often don't really read verses that well. Because you're familiar, you put that down, that's good. And then you really read, you think, good grief, I didn't realize that's quite what it was saying. And you'll see at least one of those uh, when we go through some of the scriptures uh, together. Today, of course, we're in Great Wakening. I'm in Great Wakening with you. And uh, trouble car parking as normal uh, here. Uh, at least it wasn't raining as I walked from about four miles away. It's not that four miles. Anyway, it's probably, probably half a mile away uh, to the church, uh, to here. Uh, and of course, tomorrow I'll be in Las Vegas on the Strip, uh, watching all the gore in the thousand. It's really weird life I live. Does that make sense? <laughs> I prefer to be here. Can I just say that to you? Uh, but here in Great Wakening and Las Vegas, uh, there is a huge uh, affinity for you. But that familiarity is very important. And understanding what God is saying to us is also very important. You read together, or Malcolm read with us uh, in Luke chapter 22, that very famous and well known uh, Last Supper. Jesus' Last Supper. And interesting enough, it was his last formal meal before his death and his resurrection. And of course, it has become and still is a sign or a demonstration of the new covenant that exists between God and us. Our new covenant. It's not his new covenant. It's not someone else's new covenant. If we follow Jesus, it is a symbol of our new covenant. The old covenant, the Passover, which was actually the meal that Jesus was taking part in as part of the Last Supper, symbolically timed that that was the last Passover under the old covenant, because now we have the new Passover under the new covenant. And the symbolism of that Last Supper is quick, we can quickly brush over it, but it actually is quite fundamental. Because the original Passover actually had a real lamb, a sacrificial lamb. The new covenant also has a sacrificial lamb, Jesus. Both had lambs, both had sacrifices. Ours came back to life. Theirs was a single incident that was done and dusted at the moment of sacrifice. And Jesus says in those verses, in, in verse 20, in Luke 22, a significant sentence. The next time he will celebrate communion will be with us in heaven. So for 2,000 plus years, Jesus has not celebrated communion. He's commanded that we do, as you'll see in a moment. But he himself is holding back for one thing which you often read about in the New Testament called the wedding feast, which will be the final Passover feast. You don't look very excited by that. <laughs> it's remarkable how these three things line up when you line up the scriptures together. And that Jesus is waiting in heaven for that final wedding feast to have with us. Our final, if you will, communion. Because then it is for eternity. Well, let me just remind you, and I'm not here to teach you the subject, many of you have been Christians uh, for many years, but let me just remind you about communion itself. I'm sure you know this, but just to remind you, communion is only one of two absolutes that Jesus said we should do. Jesus said we should be baptised, and Jesus said we should take communion. That's the only two things he said were absolute absolutes. And it's really interesting, the church over hundreds of years have added a whole pile of other stuff on top of that. I, used to, I grew up in the Assemblies of God Church. You may have never heard of that. It sort of thought it was a bit of a breakaway church in the sort of 40s and 50s. Lots of prayer and shouting and songs. My father was the pastor. My grandfather was the pastor. My great grand You get the clue. I came from eight generations of pastors in the AOG. Uh, my mother uh, was born to spare me because I was the first born son who wasn't the pastor uh, in all that time. I broke the whole thing. But it was interesting because in those days, you could not come to church as a woman without a hat. You couldn't stand on stage as a woman with your hair uncovered. We were not allowed to go to the cinema. You weren't allowed to wear makeup. That was a woman, by the way, not the man. You weren't allowed to wear makeup. And of course, I read the scripture, and there are some sort of verses that vaguely mention that, but it wasn't an absolute. The absolutes were baptism and communion. And when I see Christians not taking communion, and I sometimes I'm rude enough to go up and sometimes I'll say, why haven't you taken communion? Well, I don't feel so good. The Bible says you take communion. Now, there are some exceptions, and I'll come to those in a moment. And baptism is an absolute. 
So communion is that single symbolic act that shows there is a guarantee of our eternal salvation. And that's why we're reminded to take it on a regular basis. It's that symbol of repentance. And we take it again and again and again to continually remind ourselves the guarantee of eternal salvation. It is that picture of a new connection between God and man through the sacrifice of Jesus. It is a demonstration of the unquenchable, unconditional love that God gave to us through his son. Remember, Jesus died on a hill that he created. Jesus was crucified to a tree that he created. The creator died on his own hill, on his own piece of wood, to give us communion. Because that salvation is symbolic of that new connection to God. And we celebrate it, and we'll continue to celebrate it, until that feast, that wedding feast in heaven. Because anticipating the delivery of Jesus' promise, you will be with me forever. Now it's interesting, communion of course is core, it is essential, it is the bedrock of our faith. It is a constant. It is interesting in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, no one can turn to it, but they celebrated communion every day. Not once a month, not once a week, not only in mornings, every day. I know people including myself, who celebrate communion every day. Because the Bible did not say once a month. It didn't say every day either. But Acts the Apostles, they thought it was so important every day they reminded themselves of this eternal promise and had communion. Now don't say I'm saying you should do it. I'm just suggesting you should think about it uh, as a reminder of our calling. When I get confused, I return to communion because that's my bedrock. It sustains me and should sustain each of us through the marathon of life. The word communion actually given in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 actually comes from the word kionai. So I'll, I'll try and pronounce this properly. Kionai, which is a Greek word, actually means doing. You commune. We commune. You don't do communion, you do commune. You meet with, you have match with, with God. And in that participation, in fellowship, we commune vertically with our new relationship with God and we commune horizontally with our family. And therefore, as the scripture says, we need to be at peace with one another and be together in union. It's interesting to me who speaks in many different churches and many different types of churches. There's one common thing that virtually every church does. Whether you agree with them, the Methodists and the Baptists and the Catholics and all of that, all of them have some form of communion. We all sing different songs. We all worship different ways. There's a church in South London Ferris, or a building in South London Ferris, that is used, the council built, and it's used by three different churches. So sometimes when I go back, we speak three times on a Sunday morning. You know, the Baptists come in first and use it, and they fire out. The Anglicans come in and use it. They've their own cupboards, does that make sense? They get out their beats and do it, and they go out, and then the Catholics come in. So there's three churches. All three take communion. Everything else is different. I even have to change my words slightly for each of those, as you can probably imagine. You can't be too excited uh, with some of them. But it's really interesting. Communion is the common denominator. Of all of our family differences, it is a communion that gives us our identity. Last year, two years ago, I went to Lindestan. You've probably heard of Lindestan. It's a holy island, so called, uh, where Cuthbert uh, uh, communed. But there's been a church there uh, since 1180. So if you ever go there, they actually hold a communion service every Sunday morning at 8.30, and the person, the priest who conducts it, conducts it in English and Latin, uh, and it's not changed for over a thousand years. So I'll go to this. There's no music. They sing liturgy. So I'm sitting there, freezing cold, on a very uncomfortable seat. There's only probably about 20 people sitting there, and I'm taking part, listening to uh, this sort of thing, this sort of service which has a communion part to it. And what's fascinating is, I know, because I like history, Henry III sat here, Edward VII sat there. Most of the kings of England have heard the same service, the same words, in the same building, and had the same communion. Does that make sense to you? 
I can feel all that coming through me. Because that constant is a powerful reminder. All those years, communion is not about location, it's about celebrating a covenant. Now it's interesting here, if you look at your car, probably can't see past this, we have a communion table. Yes? That's a yes or no. Trying to practice yes. that, so I've got much tougher questions at the moment. This is a communion table. And behind the communion table is a chair, which I guess at one point I'm meant to be sitting in. Yeah. Later. Later. You're right, I'm not right now. But that's very important. Because communion is a hosted meal. Someone needs to host the meal. And Jesus sits there every Sunday when you have this activity. Jesus is sitting there welcoming you to his table. Just picture that in your mind. In some churches, like our church, you come up and get communion. Jesus is sitting here because a meal needs to be hosted. When you have a meal around your house or you go to a meal, someone has to host the meal. Someone has to organise it. Someone is responsible for it. Communion is no different. It has a host. Jesus is hosting the Last Supper, now our Passover, our communion, our covenant. We call it the Lord's Table. And here he is inviting you and me as a host to take part in it with him. And I guess the last thing I want to remind ourselves of before I bring another couple of points out of the scriptures, communion is the recognition of Jesus' broken body, the bread, which is a symbol of Jesus taking over our sin, our guilt, our shame, our failures, our disease, our sickness, our grief. And if we still struggle with those things, and I understand why. We need to understand what communion is meant to do. It's the breaking of the past to point to the future. And then we have the blood, the wine, which symbolises a new covenant and protection and the eternal promise. Now you would know, of course, communion comes from Exodus 12, where we have the famous story of the Israelites under Moses trying to leave Egypt. And that story, you know, where finally the angel of death passed over and every house that did not have the mark of the lamb's blood on the lintel or on the door that set their firstborn in that house died. And the Israelites and the Jews, even today, still celebrate that event every year. And that's as we know what Jesus was celebrating. That old covenant, the sacrifice, had to be dead. But on this new covenant, the sacrifice is alive. A living sacrifice. A sacrifice, as you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a living sacrifice made for us for our eternal destination. Jesus, he says in Hebrews 7, as a living sacrifice, has paid our debt in full. And under 1 Peter 3, we have a new covenant. God said in Genesis chapter 3, the forgiveness of sin needs a sacrifice. Jesus, of course, is that sacrifice. As it says in the scriptures, communion does also bring accountability, not casuality. As you read in chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks in verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood, body and blood of the Lord. A man, a woman, ought to examine himself before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Anyone who drinks and eats without recognising the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. There is a warning, a strong warning, about making sure we do not drink and partake rather in an unworthy manner. Self-centred, not according the respect, casual, not appreciating it for what it is. We ought to recognise the body, it says. Be at peace with one another. Be at peace with our Father. Put aside politics and self-promotion, condemning others, gossip. Make sure we are at peace. And as a result of those things, we will have spiritual and physical health. We need to test our hearts to make sure for us, communion has the right level of significance and we are right. The whole blood thing I find quite fascinating. I was listening to a man the other day who was a non-Christian who came to church for the first time in America. And... Uh, he went up to the end of the service and said, all right, I, I like what I hear, how can I read stuff about this? And so the pastor, like any point in fact, even us would say, here's a Bible, the New Testament, read this, and it'll give you a clue, and then come back and we can talk. 
So he's an avid reader. He took it home. He opened it up at Matthew, and he read Matthew. It's really sad, he said. The death of Jesus was really sad. He read Mark, and Jesus died a second time. He read Luke, and he found Jesus died a third time. Now you understand what I'm saying, because nobody explained the context. Nobody explained there were parallel stories. He just read it off the street. And sometimes we've got to be very careful that how we explain and talk about things doesn't make sense. The blood here sounds a very sort of dramatic thing, but it's symbolic of the lifeblood that runs through us. And now the lifeblood that makes our connection. And the last point I want to bring out before we finish. Communion is a promise. In Matthew 26, there's a promise for the new covenant of forgiveness. In Matthew 28, there's a promise through the new covenant of his presence. In John chapter 6, there's a promise the new covenant is his sustenance. In Romans 12 and verse 1, he talks about the new covenant brings transformation to our lives. In John 6, he says the new covenant brings eternal life. I can read you 26 different promises in the Bible that come from communion of the new covenant. And when I get difficult, find things are difficult, I go back to take communion. It reminds me not just of the sacrifice, but of the promise, or the promises, I should say. We are a living sacrifice, responding to Jesus' living sacrifice. Sacrifice of our lips, sacrifice of our life, sacrifice of our time, our money, our love, our emotion, sacrifice of our priorities, sacrifice sometimes perhaps of even more personal things. Because communion is a promise. So when we take communion later, just think about this. It is a verb to commune with God. And Jesus is at the head of the table, inviting us to his table to take part in what was the old covenant Passover, which is now the new covenant. Let us recognise its significance. Let us celebrate that death. But more importantly, let's celebrate what it actually gives to us, which is the promise of eternity. As we take part in communion, think about how that is the core of our faith, and from that springs everything else. And let us remember that Jesus is at the head of our table. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to recognise the importance and significance of communion, particularly as we take it in a few moments' time, but also, Lord, when we take it from now on, to be reminded time and time again what it really stands for. I ask these things in thy name. Amen. Before we take communion, we're going to stand and sing a song uh, which is called, uh, which you'll be very familiar with, when I survey the wondrous cross.